Daily Tick News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Justin Zellers, Pepper Giese, Carmen Bailey, and lifetime supporter Kevin Metcalf. On this episode of DTNS, Meta is kind of into news again. AI is developing faster than the internet, and Tasia Custodia is here to tell us about her time using Pixel Studio. This is the Daily Tech News Show for Friday, October 25th, 2024. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And we've got a guest, folks. Tasia Custody is with us, YouTuber and host of AI Name This Show and the Talk Techie to Me podcast. Tasia, how you been doing? Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm, I wish I had an update since I last saw y'all, but... Same, same old. <laughs> just, just plugging away, <laughs> plugging Trucking away. Along. Yeah, I, 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 I hear that. Well, it's good to see you, and we're going to talk to you more in the show. But let's get to the quick hits. Blue Sky is set to introduce a premium tier, but unlike other platforms, it won't offer preferential treatment to paying users. While premium subscribers will gain access to features like custom profile options and enhanced video uploads, they won't receive any visibility boosts or verification badges. The platform is also planning a tip jar feature to allow creators to monetize their content directly, although it's not, un or should say it is unclear if Blue Sky will take a commission from these payments. Google Photos plans to offer a new feature noting whether an image has been edited using AI tools. The information will include details about the specific tools used, Magic Editor, Magic Eraser, Zoom Enhance, for example, and will be displayed alongside general file information. This AI info section will be accessible in the image details view on both the web and app versions in Google Photos. The feature will also note when a photo is a composite of multiple images, as is the case with features, sometimes with Pixel's Best Take and Add Me. A Google survey of nearly 3,000 technology professionals found that over three quarters of them rely on artificial intelligence for at least one daily professional responsibility. But 39% say they don't trust AI-generated code. Google's 2024 State of the DevOps report says that AI adoption was positively correlated with increased flow, productivity, job satisfaction, code quality, and internal documentation quality. But when it comes to using AI to generate code, nearly four in 10 respondents have little to no trust in AI. Waymo has secured a big old $5.6 billion in funding to expand its robo-taxi service across the United States. The company says the funds will not only allow expansion to areas of the U.S. like upstate New York, Michigan, parts of Northern California, places that it just doesn't operate right now, but also advance the company's self-driving technology for commercial applications. Notably, Waymo, only the company right now, currently operating a commercial robo-taxi service in several major areas of the U.S. And the company recently agreed to a multi-year strategic partnership with Hyundai that would add the iconic five electric vehicle to its robo-taxi fleet. Today is Call of Duty Black Ops 6 launch day, though some players were actually able to start playing Thursday evening. This is the first COD released since Microsoft purchased Activism Blizzard in 2023, and the first Call of Duty released on Game Pass Ultimate day one. Game Pass is, is Xbox's monthly subscription service that allows gamers to play hundreds of games without having to purchase them individually. Call of Duty is one of the most successful game franchises ever, with 450 million units sold and over $31 billion made to date. I personally will be playing it in about 30 minutes after we get done with GDI. <laughs> Uh, so let's dig into some of these uh, tech stories. Uh, Meta has announced a multi-year deal with Reuters to integrate real-time news content into its AI chatbot. Starting Friday, U.S. users can query Meta's AI chatbot for news and current events, receiving summaries and links to relevant, re relevant Reuters articles. While the specific details of the partnership, including any potential licensing for AI modeling training, remain undisclosed, Meta has confirmed that the collaboration will enhance its AI chatbot's ability to provide accurate, up-to-date news information. Now, Meta has made it pretty clear that they don't really like it when it comes to news on their, on their social media platforms, but that does not really appear to be the case when it comes to their chatbot. Tasia, I was just wondering, you know, what you think about this? Is, is Reuters just a one-off for Meta, or is this the first of many, in your opinion? The first of many, Rob, for sure, because like if you're listening to the language in this and they don't really give us all the details, and I think that's 
for a reason because they're probably looking to expand into other partnerships with other news agencies. And I'm really curious to know like behind the scenes of it in terms of how it's using it as like training data for Llama, right? So I'm I'm very curious, but I would think it's a smart move for them to have this as the first of many. You know, the more information people want, the more information people want. You know, the more you provide, the more they want. And you're going to want that breadth of information to give people as well, to be able to have like Llama to pull from, to give for pe- to people. So yeah, I'm curious to see how quick this will happen too, how many partnerships start tumbling down the line now. <laughs> Well, you know, the whole idea with uh, Meta and specifically on Facebook, uh, the, you know, the idea of, of the, the relationships with news organizations breaking down was a very different thing. You know, an AI chatbot that Meta, you know, pays for information to make its chatbot be used by as many of its users as possible, is, that's, a very, that's a very different partnership. And I, I think I think the company <laughs> may have just thrown in the towel, you know, on the whole on the whole news thing because again, you know, for you know, for context, back in the day, if you know, if I shared a Reuters story on Facebook and there was a little blurb and Reuters wasn't getting a cut of that, it was like that was the the issue that news organizations had with Meta. You know, Facebook specifically, but certainly with Meta overall. And so, if 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 the if the chatbot is smarter because Meta needs this information, then and and this is not the only company doing this and making these sorts of uh, deals by far. I, I yeah, I, I I agree with you, Tasia. I I see a lot more of this going forward. I think that it's not just Meta. It's Meta. It's Perplexity. It's OpenAI. It's Google. Yeah. They all want their chat bot to become a verb like Google did for search. So when you think about how people are using chat bots, they're going to ask it newsy stuff. So, you know, so Meta cannot type, you know, can't hold the line for their entire company. Say we don't really want news on anything. They just say we don't want it in the social media where it can kind of, you know, be messy. But people who are looking for answers, they want to know. Um, you know, about something that happened in the news. And they're hoping that the, I should say that, you know, Meta is hoping that their chat bot is a place where people will go to ask those kind of questions. So it just makes sense. And, and, and even, you know, if you look further into it, Reuters has been fact checking partner for Meta for, um, for four or five years now. Um, so the fact that they've been doing that, it just kind of makes sense that they would work out a deal here. Um, it is going to be interesting to me though, because this, this article didn't make any mention to how they're licensing data from, from Reuters. Are they going to be using that journalistic data to actually train their algorithms? That probably is fodder for, for a much longer conversation, potentially on a different day. Well, and also then it gets uh, into a sort of a conversation of, well, how many partnerships you have, because if a model is trained on, you know, you know, if you if if two companies have an agreement and one company is comprised of, I don't know, let's say ten to fifteen journalists, well, then it's going to sound a lot like those journalists. That might be great. That might be exactly what you're looking for. It also might not. So you know, you have to. You, it's like how wide does the pool need to be before everyone says, "Oh, this is fair." You know, fair and balanced. I mean, no one's ever going to say that, but you know, <laughs> as fair as and balanced as possible. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see like how quick this landscape is shifting because, like you guys were saying, you know, it wasn't how many months ago when these news organizations were pissed at companies like OpenAI and stuff. And now it's like, yeah, well, we'll go where the money is. And like, if you're going to pay us, like you have to think of it as these guys are already using the content to train their, their large language yeah, models. Get like, the money. FYI. Yeah. yeah. So secure the bag. You know what I mean? So, and don't yeah. do any exclusivities. Cause yeah, to I your think- point, Sarah, it's like, we want a well developed breadth of information, not just one lane. I think well, you're going to see the news organizations be much smarter 
about working deals out. Whereas before it was like, please come take our data until they realized how adverse that was to their bottom line. Now it's going to be, it's like, yeah, we want you to put your stuff in your AI chat bot, but we want to check and we want those checks to come monthly or quarterly or, 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 or whatever the deal, uh, you know, whatever the deal recommends. But the, I think that news organizations, they want their data to be there, but they are going to definitely work on licensing where they're getting paid for it because they know that this is going to take traffic away from their actual websites. I wonder, and and maybe this is already in play more than I know about, but you know the the whole idea of like if you're an actor and you get residuals every time you know your episode gets rerun reran on you know a, a particular channel, you know do, does does the person who wrote that article really benefit from this, or does the company that the person worked for at the time, at which they don't anymore? benefit from this. And I think the, those sorts of, you know, structured partnerships are, you know, one of the biggest questions that I have at this point. It's going to be yeah, really interesting. A whole new business model. Definitely. And quite a few. Um, all right. So <laughs> uh, on the AI front at the Bloomberg Tech Summit in London happened this week, ARM CEO Renee Haas predicted that AI will progress more quickly than the internet itself transforming sectors like healthcare, transportation, and manufacturing. This is something that I don't think any of us argue about, but uh, I, I thought what was interesting is at what pace. He highlighted the need for efficient high-performance chips to support the future of AI, noting that ARM is focused at this point on AI-capable processors. That's ARM is kind of all in on that. Now, Haas says that chips are important for things like diagnostics and autonomous systems and energy efficiency, all things that many sectors are working on right now. The company obviously wants to be at the forefront of this. And as the CEO of ARM, you're obviously going to say this. But mm -hmm. just remembering a pre-world, uh, you know, a, a world pre-internet. Um, which I, I was alive for, um, feels hard to do, but I remember, I remember things were very different, but it changed humankind. It didn't change humankind in a year or three years, but over the last 30 years, absolutely so much. The, Tasia, I wanted to ask you, what do you think about the idea of our world, world changing that much faster because of AI? I mean, I don't think it's going to be 30 years. I think it's going to be more like three. Yeah, I mean, I think it's maybe more like 10. But <laughs> for me, I think it's it's once that infrastructure is in place, has been vetted, has been tested. It's kind of like your point about the internet. Like, we don't really just remember, I mean, some of us might remember a day where a specific thing happened where you're like, oh, this is a game changer. <laughs> but it's yeah. it's kind of more this evolution. And so if you take something like the healthcare industry and AI, I think so much of it is going to be an evolution and it'll happen really fast once everything is in place and has been implemented and has been proven to work and has been proven to be private, maybe with people's data, et cetera, all of the things accurate. If you're like a doctor looking for information for your patient or whatever it may be. Yeah. But, and in terms of, you know, production of vaccines, we're, we're already seeing that type of stuff yeah. and, and it I mean, going even in so the much faster sector, than it could. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got radiologists being like, this just makes my job, makes me be a better doctor. 100%. Yeah. I think the speed cannot be underestimated how fast things are changing. I mean, you know, here we are talking about AI and it's a conversation we have darn near daily now. Two years ago, no one was having this conversation because ChatGPT3 wasn't out yet. So it hasn't even been two years yet. And, and where are we now? And then when you think about the internet, a big reason why it took a minute for the internet to progress is because the infrastructure for it had to be laid. You had to actually get to the point to where people actually had computers at the house, that they actually yeah. had fast internet connections, that uh, the, the cables had to be laid yeah. for all that, data centers had to be, all those things had to be built. Really when it comes to AI, what, what is holding us back? Well, the chips are being built, that, that's definitely happening. And it, but the, the real bottleneck is power. These things suck up enormous amounts of energy. So they've got to build, in some cases, nuclear power plants. They've got to do solar. All the ways you can get power is the way that these things need power. But when you think about that, that can get ramped up much more quickly than trying to get an entire country on a grid so you can actually even receive 
the data that these AI, uh, you know, bots can ultimately create. So I, in 30 years, no way. I, I, you know, I don't know three, but I think we're in a five to 10 year range to where we're going to see the world is going to function significantly different in five to 10 years because of what AI uh, is, pre is presenting as compared to the, the internet definitely, you know, it, it has done the same thing, but it just took a little longer because all that infrastructure had to first be late. It kind of feels like, I know it's not, it's a little apples to oranges, but it's like, okay, internet being a thing in the world, you know, let's call it 1994. I know it started earlier than that, but that's when a lot of people got like America online for the first time. You know, it's like, okay, what do we do? <laughs> let's start chatting, you know, that sort of thing. And then I feel like the mobile revolution was, you know, how everything changed now. I mean, I'm sitting at a desktop right now. That's still how I prefer to do the show. But most of my life is in a mobile world. And it didn't used to be that way besides, like, texting my friends. You know, for a long time, like, you would have a cell phone and you would call or text your friends. There was no, you couldn't do anything else. I mean, even with a BlackBerry, you could kind of, like, check your email. But no. Um, and now it's like, okay, now we're, we're in that, we're in that third wave of some kind where it's like, all right, what is this all going to do for us? Is this, you know, it, I know people wring their hands about, oh, you know, everyone's going to lose their, lose their jobs. And that's going to happen in some capacity, but it's more of like, what is this going to do for us as a human race? But, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to live? Is it going to be better? I think in many ways, the answer is yes, it, it is going to be better because information is that much quicker, you know, and at our fingertips, but you know, it's, it's going to be different. Yeah. Efficiencies, how we use this, like when we talk about we start getting agents and that's when it's going to be really helpful, I think, for us in terms of just like our day to day lives, you know, like to your point, Sarah, it's kind of just like easy for us to say now, like, oh, it's cool because, you know, like we're chatting with our chatbots and like, yeah, it's they're not really like booking our tickets yet or they're not really, you know, like we're we're close, um, you know, we're making images. But it's like once this actually becomes more of like being our actual assistants. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's when things are going to get real crazy. And two, like for efficiency for everybody, like if you can offload something and have it doing that work for you or doing something you would do like way more efficient, you, where's your strength that could be focused here? And if we can all just be positive about it and if we can all use it for good, this would be great. Yeah. Yeah. We won't be panicking yeah. in 10 years. Well, yeah, and that that whole idea of like the persona is is okay. It can be trained on me. Maybe it can sound pretty darn near like me. Um, for all things my life related. Um, I don't want to not hang out with my friends and <laughs> just be like, hang out with my persona instead. You know, it's like that the whole idea for me is like, oh, you have more time to be yourself and do the mm -hmm. things that you actually want to do instead of the, you know, minutia that we all have to deal with. But I think that's still, we're still in those early days where we don't know. Yeah, you, you think about it. We're in a stage now where, where literally all data is available to you at your fingertips. There, there's, there's pretty much nothing you can't find out on your phone in the middle of a field as long as there's a cell tower near it. And what we're moving into is that now that all data is available, we've got these really, really smart computers that can just look at all data simultaneously and make correlations and and give you answers on all that data at the speed of you asking it. And and that's that's where AI is right now. But that's that's just been in the last couple of years that we've noticed it. So just think of where we're going to be in three years and five years in 10 years. Mm hmm. So what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? One way is to let us know inside of our subreddit. Subreddit stories can be voted on at www.reddit.com slash r slash daily tech news show. As part of its Pixel 9 line announcement back in August, Google also revealed Pixel Studio, powered by both on-device generative AI and Google's own cloud-based Image in 3 text-to-image model. The app lets users create images through prompts. 
Now, Tasia, you've spent some time using Pixel Studio, and it's uh, probably quick and easy. <laughs> at, least, at least Google's onstage demo uh, made it seem that way. Yeah, it, it is. I was actually surprised because I thought, well, this isn't going to work quite like this, and it's not going to work fast. But it did, and it does. <laughs> so I've been playing around with it a little bit. I mean, just to create kind of fun, some fun random images right now. But it is very quick, you guys. Like I'm talking, I think I wait like two seconds and it's completely generated an image. Sometimes on a regenerate, it might be three seconds, but it's, I was pleasantly surprised, I guess, in terms of speed, in terms of accuracy. You can't create any images of humans yet, obvious for obvious reasons. <laughs> Google's had some issues with that. So I think they're taking it slow with yeah. that yeah. a little bit. Um, what I do find interesting, and that's a little bit different than the demo, from what I remember from the demo when they showed the regenerate, it kept a lot of the same formatting of the picture. Now I feel like when you hit a regenerate, if you say want to add something or um, not the regenerate, but if you add something to your prompt to, you know, like, okay, I want to add something to this photo, it changes the whole composition and it changes it doesn't like keep it and add the one thing. Like if you're like, like add a moon in the sky. It doesn't keep everything as is and then add a moon. It completely changes the whole image. So that is a little bit different than what the demo was. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's been a pretty easy experience for me. I guess it's just more like for me, I question if I need an on-device image generator. Like, like, do I actually need it? Well, that that was going to be my first question, right? It's yeah. like, okay, it's cool to have the technology, but unless I'm just like throwing funny like memes at friends, which I do, I mean, you know, sure, fairly, I, you know, like h how much is this going to help me? Totally depends on what you do for work and, you know, what you do for fun, right? Yeah, I think a, the big argument for me for it is, there's something to be said for staying within the ecosystem in which you live and work and breathe. So for anyone that is either in a Google ecosystem or like a pixel ecosystem or something, it's huge to not have to go out to a third party to now do the thing, whatever the thing may be. So that is my big argument for my, the reason I question it is because I found like for me and, and granted, I'm not like an influencer. I don't do a lot of static image posts on social media. I also see a use case for small businesses, entrepreneurs, things like this, where you're pumping out a bunch of content yeah. and now you can do basic stuff that looks good. Or yeah. Good maybe you're for selling social. some shoes and right. you just want it to, you know, kind of look cooler than what you could do otherwise. Right. Do, do you see a significant benefit to this happening on device as compared to if it just made a call to a server? in the same amount of time got the, you know, the, it was generated on a server and then it was just sent back to you. Is, is there any big reason why doing it on device makes a big difference? I mean, speed and also people will claim, you know, privacy and security, but I'm always for, and especially with this, like this does both. It, it is using like imagine three from Google as well. So like, but I'm always a believer of don't prompt anything. You wouldn't want your grandma to see <laughs> in the first place, whether on device or in the cloud. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, so the, the big, it's the security thing and whatever people think that might be in their head, that's like a big reason of like why to do it on device. Um, also from, if you, I realize this is using both, but if you can focus on things that are on device, typically it might use less resources. Like, that's another reason for me why I question like, this is cool. And I've had a lot of fun making images of animals and stuff, but like, do I need to be using like our natural resources for this? <laughs> like I created an image of a penguin wearing a top hat, riding an elephant while cute. <laughs> like, did I, did I need to make that image? Did I <laughs> use it for anywhere? Like I use it in my YouTube video about pixel studio, but like, am I killing the earth for this? I don't know you guys. <laughs> I listened to a podcast recently where somebody made the same, um, I mean, it was kind of, they were kind of making a joke, but it was the same, it was the same comment of like, and this was specifically related to Apple's, um, 
uh, it, being able to, you know, create your own emoji, you know, from scratch. Like I want right. a squirrel holding a microphone, you know, that kind of thing. And they were like, cool that you can do it in theory, just because you can, mm -hmm. but also at what cost, you know, like how, how much is this something that we all need? Although, although I think humans adapt pretty quickly. There was a time where, you know, going back to our conversation about, you know, pre-internet days where I was like, uh, you know, the, I mean, you just had like one computer in like the office and that's where you go and do computer things and you come out and like be a human again. <laughs> you know, yeah. that is not, that is just simply not, that's not the world we live in anymore. Emojis at one point, I thought they're kind of stupid. And now I'm like, can't live without them. You know, so well, I think, yeah. I, th I really think we adapt quickly to these yeah. things. Yeah, I can remember a time when if I wanted to make a phone call, I had to actually walk into the kitchen and stand up in the kitchen at the phone. It was to make attached. The phone call. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It was. No, it was, it was, on, it was, it was on the wall. It Same. was part of the wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Had a whole yeah. a whole device hanging on the wall. There was a, there was the a dial, Rob. <laughs> there was. Yeah. 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 yeah there was. You no, know, I mean, it, so it, that's the thing. Is like, it's like, I think it's it's important for us all to be mindful of how we're using these tools and why. And, you know, like I, I did in my animal image creation, I created one cause I have a border collie of a border collie catching a tennis ball in the air. And it was a freestyle version of it. Cause you can set different image styles. I find the freestyle ones are most like lifelike and, um, you know, listen, if I had a border collie rescue or if I was a dog yeah. trainer or something, I mean, what a quick and easy way. Like, I don't need exactly. to hire a photographer. Yeah. yeah. It's like the Instagram ad, you don't even have to really Bingo. work at. Bingo. Yeah. I can see artists just cringing right now as they listen to this conversation. It's just not a good day for them. I'm Hasn't sorry, but I'm not an years. artist. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Like I said, it, it's, I'm, I'm still struggling to see why do we need to do this on device? I understand that, well, privacy, but like I said, border collie with a tennis ball, I, <laughs> what do you need to be private about that? I just thought it was, you know, a little, little, little different. Yeah. yeah, there's, there's definitely Rob. I mean, you, you make a good point and we have artists on our show, um, uh, quite regularly and, you know, artists being like, oh man, you know, I could have done that better or differently or just me, you know, it's, it's, that is definitely, that's definitely something, uh, to consider here. But Tasia, to your point, yeah, you have a small business, <laughs> you're running a border collie rescue, you, you know, you, you know, just want to, you know, doctor up something real quick and maybe even, you know, add some art on top of that, but just get started. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's where AI works for, at least for everything that I do is like, just get me started on Correct. some things. You know, I, it's not that I'm just sitting back sleeping while you're doing it. No, that it, it, we're, we're not there yet. And I don't even want to be there, but it's more of like, okay, you know, help me out doing stuff that I'm not that good at so that I can do the thing that I am good at. Exactly. And I use it exactly like you're saying. So whether it's image generation, whether I'm asking Gemini or another LLM to help me get my thoughts in order and structure something for me, whether it be a presentation or a webinar or help me write something, it's a starting point for me. It's don't rely on, on what it's giving you. I always try to tell people that, <laughs> but use it to help you brainstorm. Use it to help you get started. Use it to help you say like, you know, if you are not artistic, Rob, like me, it could be something where say you are employing a graphic designer or somebody, but, but you're having trouble saying like, this is like my thought, like I, you know, like this. Well, if you can have these tools like a Pixel Studio tell you, help help tell your designer what you're looking for, it can help get your idea out. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely. Yeah. Very Best much of so. Both worlds. Especially, yeah, would not everybody speak in the same language, especially when it comes to design? Um, well, Len Peralta uh, tried to make the show today. Unfortunately, he couldn't, he couldn't join us, but he did create art for us. 
This is a message about the future of news, courtesy of Meta and Reuters. <laughs> oh my gosh. Zuckerberg name, handsomest man in the world. Mm hmm. Zuck coin makes initial big splash in economy. Mm hmm. 10 ways big Zuck changed my life. Okay, so I see what you're going for, Len. Um, we, th this is why, this is why. <laughs> We were we were advocating for you know if Meta's gonna make a relationship with one company let's you know let's let's uh, let's expand um, because uh, we don't just want you know that one reporter at Reuters to be your next chatbot but uh, <laughs> but good yeah. stuff good stuff as always if you want a free digital copy of today's art made by Len Peralta become a patron of Lens at Patreon.com/Len. Len's also doing holiday cards. It's that time of year, everybody. He has done holiday cards for so many of you, and he is so good at it. If you want a custom-drawn holiday card, Len is your man. You can commission him at lenperaltastore.com. So thanks to Len Peralta, and thank you, Tasia Custodi. Can you tell the folks what you've got going on? Yeah, people can find me on YouTube. I'm at Teja Custodi. And also my fellow tech expert, Tristan Jutra, and I have a podcast all about AI. It's called AI Named This Show. Guys, we do keep it a little bit fun. We try, we try not to be doomers. We keep it light. And we try to clear up all the jargon for everybody around AI. And folks, I know people are already missing Tom as he is on vacation. But if you like to get more Tom, you can watch Tom's Top 5, the show where Tom breaks down the top five things you need to know about a technology. This week, Tom counts down the top five scariest tech horror movies. You can catch it at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, at DTNS Picks on Instagram, and YouTube at YouTube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. Patrons also stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. It's Friday and time for a round of which would you rather be more scared of? AI chatbot version of yourself, AM, PM food or public speaking. Find <laughs> out your fears. Oh, boy. You can catch our show live Monday through Friday. Sometimes it's horror. Sometimes it isn't. 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again on Monday as we discuss how to do a good podcast using generative AI and perhaps even a version of yourself with Allison Sheridan joining us. Have a great weekend. This week's episode of Daily Tech News Show was created by the following people. Host producer writer Tom Merrick, host producer writer Sarah Lane, executive producer Booker Roger Chang, producer writer co host Rob Dunwood, video producer Joe Kuntz, producer at large Anthony Lemos, Spanish language host writer producer Dan Campos, science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackerman, social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding, our mods Beatmaster W. Scottis S1, BioCow, Captain Kipter, Steve Guadarrama, Steve Guadarrama. Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luders, Mustafa A., Acast, and Lim Peralta. Live art performed by Lim Peralta. Acast ad support, Tatiana Matias. But Patreon support, Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's show include Shannon Moore, Scott Johnson, and Justin Robert Young. Guests for this week's show included Ariel Waldman, Craig Porter, and Tasia Custodi. And thanks to all of our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>